Hi everyone, it's Katie from Alston Park Friends. Can you believe it? This is day five. We've got to the halfway point in our Star Party 2021. Can't quite believe that. Um, now, all of this is about brightening the place up and um, taking our minds off the things that are going on around us. But um, there was one thought that came into my head. I did most of my growing up in the 1980s. Can you just imagine being in lockdown in the 1980s? I mean, really? TV went off about 11 o'clock at night. So you had to be in the right place at the right time. Okay, you had to be there for whatever program you might want to see want to see and there wasn't a huge amount of choice even ringing somebody up on the phone oh gosh it takes ages with the dialing um on those little rotary phones um no ordering food from supermarkets and having it turned up turn up at your door in fact yeah we were still in the world of snail mail um This was the world where they, oh, I remember the Pi symbol. The Pi symbol was the best computer graphics for a little guard dog. I mean, this was this was cutting edge. Um, I grew up seeing the Pi symbol as a little guard dog, and I was most put out when I learnt about Pi in circles. I mean, what are you doing? Are you... Are you tethering the dog? Oh, Brian, ZX Spectrums. Oh, yeah. Um, we upgraded to one of those. I started with a Sharp MZ80. This is where the Pi symbol dogs came from. Um, these were the days if you wanted to play a computer game, you'd get some magazine through your door with the code in, and then you'd have to type it all in, and, and then maybe you could play. Um, but, yeah, when I started learning about circles and Pi in, in school, I was just thinking, what are you doing to this dog? You're tethering it so it can only go around in circles. Poor thing. Um, anyway, it's lovely that we can come here and um, just have a little bit of togetherness in a virtual way and enjoy the night sky. Um <laughs> Steve's put, can you imagine trying to do this with dial-up internet? Oh, I remember those little beepy sounds. Absolutely. Um, it's really lovely to see so many people here from Derby District Astronomical Society just there in the backgrounds. Um, really is appreciated that you're coming. You didn't have to. I tried to timetable in some um, time off for you. Um, should you want to take it so you don't have to do any of this <laughs> and it's it's great that you're here and and doing this um oh donald um today is the anniversary of the apollo one fire which took the lives of three astronauts oh that's i hate it when that happens it's um yeah tough tough anniversaries tough days all around today Anthony said that was the 27th of January, 1967. Well, today I'm going to keep, take you on a little bit of a tour of Mercury. And then I'm going to introduce you to some of my old friends. I studied them a lot at university. Um, and they're the four largest moons of Jupiter, the Galilean moons. Um, just to let you know what's coming up in the rest of the week, Tomorrow is the day of Jupiter. We're doing some of the moons of Jupiter today, but Jupiter itself, you'll have to come and tune in tomorrow. Um, telescopes and binoculars, which is best. Derby and District Astronomical Society will be there to answer all your technical questions about telescopes, binoculars. That's fantastic. Friday, day of Venus. Um, it will work a little bit like today. Well, I'll do a planet bit and then you have more of me and I'm going to squeeze a few billion years in about 20 minutes. Wish me luck. Um, Saturday is the day of Saturn, okay? Um, this is the day of feasting and frivolity, so if anybody else wants to bake some sort of planety food stuff, if you've got a picture of some planety food stuff, just send it to us. Um, best place to send it is 
to messages at Elveston Park Friends on Facebook that they get picked up quite quite well. Um, and of course, we're going to have Derby and District Astronomical Society talk about the James Webb Telescope. That's a really exciting launch and infrared astronomy. Um, if you think you've seen it all by um, looking through telescopes, binoculars on, on Stellarium, well, Stellarium will show you a little bit of this, but um, even the biggest optical telescope in the world will only show you a fraction, tiny fraction of what's out there. Okay, we need to look in different colors, invisible colors that we can't see. And then on Sunday, Sunday is the day when we have Ian Russell along. Um, he's an award-winning science communicator who's done shows around the world and he's doing a little piece for us um, about space and the sheer huge, enormous distances that we have to contend with. Um, that's going to be amazing. So please share. Um, a little bit of news as well. Um, people have been watching the replays um, and still signing up for our first day. And that's nice. So keep keep sharing. You're obviously doing your jobs of sharing, but but let's keep going because we've reached um, two more countries to add to our map. We've um, added Portugal and the Philippines. Got no idea how we got there, but it's great that you've come to, to visit and to enjoy some of our star stuff. And Brian says, any food or baking doesn't last long enough to be displayed. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. But if it does, um, if you if it lasts long enough to, for you to take a photo of it, then that would be perfect. Um, if by any chance anybody has been um, decorating their windows or walls or anything with stars, just take a photo, share it. That's, that's really cool too. Um, so... Mercury. Um, somebody said yesterday that it's often overlooked. I agree, and I cannot possibly um, do anything on Mercury without mentioning an overlooked group of people as well. And um, they were the Mercury 13. This was a group of women who were um, trained alongside the male astronauts in the 1960s. They did, they they came from all sorts of interesting backgrounds, most involving flying. They were the best pilots in the USA at the time. And they were sourced and they were asked to um, take part in astronaut training. There was a desire to know whether women would be as good as men in space. Um, many of these women gave up their jobs, um, some permanently, to do this. Um, you can imagine what it was like being a female pilot in the 1960s. You had to be pretty tough to get those, those opportunities and um, had to be pretty good too. Anyway, they were put through all the horrendously difficult astronaut training there. Um, they looked at pain tolerance, psychological experiments. Everything was the same, with one exception, as far as I know. And those were the psychological experiments. The women had to do those far longer than the men. Okay. Um, this was kept under wraps for for many many dec decades, really after after they they did it. Um, so um, I don't believe I know I know that one of them, her name was Wally Funk, was trying to get up into space um, quite late in her life. I think she was trying to get up with the Russians. I I don't know whether she made it or not but what an amazing bunch of people and it was kept quiet for so long um anthony says no um so i'm trying to do my bit to give them a bit of a shout out that i think that they deserve 
Um, onto the planet now, okay? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to whiz you to Mercury because I found this and I just really loved it. Um, let's see if I can I can do the share screen, okay, this time. Yeah, Brian Dodson says, Helen Sharman did. Yeah, I mentioned Helen Sharman. I was lucky enough to watch her talk, um, I think in 2019. Um, she's was the first Briton in space, um, kept very quiet for a while, but um, her talk was really, really fascinating. Um, she was asked where... Um, her piece of advice what 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 advice you would give to anybody going up into space and her answer was make sure you have time to have a look out of the window she says you're so busy with all all the things that you have to do um and she says yes yeah, she spent a week above the mere space station yes she did she um Yeah, she had an amazing mission and she said, yeah, um, there was a window by where she worked on on, this, on space station um, and she tried to make time to look out of it. And there was a little crack in it. And she said, well, what made that crack was a tiny fleck of paint. Can you imagine that? They're going around, they're orbiting so fast that even a tiny fleck of paint flying through space had the ability to um, damage these really super strong windows of the space station. Anyway, if I can zoom you to Mercury for a little while, um, this is a picture of earth just there and the moon as seen from mercury um i believe this yep this is um taken with um the messenger messenger stands for mercury surface space environment geochemistry and ranging okay so these um ac there's a lot of acronyms in the astronomy world we have machos we have wimps we have messenger a lot of them they that they are actually acronyms that some of them quite bizarre and convoluted i think astronomers tend to um really um stretch this idea of acronyms anthony's got something really interesting when a space shuttle challenges forward windows was damaged by a paint fleck whilst in earth orbit you know all of these things to worry about um and it could be something as simple as a a paint flag um i heard something else like about the space shuttle you know it's i can't remember where this was from but i remember the talk was of having so many millions of parts so if you've got um several million parts and they've got say on average a one in a million chance of failure <laughs> well you'll have um statistically it's likely that several of those parts will fail on your mission um that's a, a sobering thought i think um i was also reminded and i dug this out of my archives this is one of my um my own photos this is the sun projected onto a piece of paper and this goes back to i think it was 2016 when derby and district astronomical society came over to alveston park to do some solar observing and if you look very carefully um this is not a mark on your computer screen well it might be but there is something underneath that mark if it is um anthony says i remember it well um they they set up the situation where we could safely view the sun either through solar filters or by projecting the image onto a piece of paper, which is this this, this tiny flag is Mercury. This is the transit of Mercury. Um, this up here, I believe, is a sunspot. So you can see that. 
as well. But see how tiny it is. It just gives you an idea of the sheer size of the sun as well. Um, now, I I needed, I was feeling a little bit um, cooped up today. I needed to get out. Um, and I need to thank two people who haven't had a shout out yet. Um, they deserve an especially good one for um, they, they've been doing stuff all week or all, well for, for the last few weeks they've been there doing things um, getting me coffee uh, there's a Dan my husband and and my son Theo and I wrote them into something today um, I wrote them in to a little video and I'm really hoping it works. So thank you very much. This is Dan. I told him to stand there and shine, which is why he's got his head torch on. This is Theo. Um, so Dan here is the um, sun, shining like the sun. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Theo here is Mercury. Now, um, as seen from outside the solar system, um, Mercury has a 3-2 spin orbit relationship. So that means it turns on its axis three times for every twice it goes around the sun. Now, what that means is that um, if you were living on Mercury, you would ha effectively have one day every two years. Let me show you how this works, because I, I looked at this and I, I thought, how? And this is how it works. So um, this, is, this is Mercury. Mercury has his back to us. If I um, press play, yeah, the sun's waving to us. That's great. And um, Mercury's going to orbit the sun now. He's going to stop and wave at us and notice he'll be facing us when he does that. Yeah, hi, Mercury. Okay. And then he's going around sideways. I'm just going to pause it there. Now, this is how really the moon orbits the sun. Okay, so we get the same. Sorry, go back on that. This is the way that the moon orbits the earth. Okay, so it's got the same face facing the earth all of the time so for every orbit that the moon does of earth the moon also spins around once the periods are the same um, in the case of mercury if you think you've got a three two relationship um that means you go one and a half times around on your spin every um, orbit. Okay, so Theo has gone, um, I'm just going to rewind that so that you get to see that. As Theo has gone, Mercury's gone, hi son, Mercury will go one rotation, okay, here. So he's now facing us. So if he's facing the sun, which he has been all along, there we go, then it's daytime, except in actual fact, he's gone another half rotation, which means that it's now nighttime. That's how it works. Now, because Mercury um, spins so slowly, if you were to go to the planet itself, let's go to the planet itself, there you go. Then what would happen if you saw a sunrise is you'd see the sun rise up, it would go down and set up momentarily and then it would rise up again. Same thing would happen at sunset, it, the sun would set, rise again and then set for quite a long time. So, um, Imagine having just one day 
in every two years. I'd better say something about Mercury in the mythology because I promised stories and Mercury is um, was the Roman um, god of all sorts of things. Um, commerce and trade and wealth and um, thieves, the god of thieves, um, particularly agricultural trade. Um, he was the messenger god um, and was often depicting wearing both winged sandals and a winged hat. Um, so he could very quickly get messages to the other gods very, very quickly. Um, that's appropriate because Mercury is the fastest of the planets. Even the Babylonians would have seen that it moves fastest across, well, not, no, it wouldn't have moved fastest, but of, of the planets, it, it would have been faster moving across from the backdrop of stars as well. But that's a little bit different. I spent ages as a kid trying to work out whether um, Mercury was faster because it simply took less time to get around the sun because it had less distance to travel, or if it were um, actually faster. The answer is both. It has got less to travel because it's the closest planet to the sun, but it is actually traveling faster as well. It takes about 88 days for it to get around the sun once. Um, Mercury has been associated with the um, with Wednesday for a very very long time, but it's not quite obvious from our English name for Wednesday. It's if you think about it in French, the connection is really definitely there, and that's because some Anglo-Saxon um, and Norse gods took over. Um, the Roman mythology that was already in place. But there is something that I'm going to say about the god Woden because it really struck, struck me. First of all, he's everywhere, okay? Um, there's lots of place names after him, like Wansdyke, Wensbury, Warns Hill, Woden's Plain. He also had a nickname, Grim, which simply meant that he, one who wears a hood, to mask his face and that nickname gives um, our Grimsby, Grimley, Grimesthorpe. Um, so he's obviously was a very key character in um, Anglo-Saxon mythology. Um, but Woden used to have two ravens who sat on his shoulders. Um, their names were Hugin which were thought, and Moonin, which meant memory. And they would fly out into the universe and come back with the information they found. And when I read about that, I just thought, these two ravens, they're like our space telescopes. You need a human thought and desire to get them out there. And then, of course, you need all the computer memory to store all of this amazing information that is gathered from the far reaches of the universe. I think Woden, he was onto something there. Um, let's move on um, to this one. This is a, a true color version of Mercury. And I know. Um, hi, Ro, and I can see you've turned up. We had a discussion yesterday about the use of colour. Um, I like it both ways, of course. Um, and I can see the benefits of both. So I've tried to include that throughout this, this little talk. Um, if we can use some of the data that we get from Mercury, the light that is reflected off of Mercury is just a tiny part of it. Um, here you go. This is um, Mercury that's been coloured in um, where the gravity is strongest. Now, this is opening up a whole new picture of the um, planet. Um, Mariner 10 did 
take some awesome pictures of um, Mercury. But these red spots are where the gravity is unusually strong. Okay, so now our eyes are opening up to some maybe features below the surface. Um, this might um, suggest some more dense rock or, or something like that. Um, this is lovely. Um, we talked a little bit about craters yesterday. Um, here, the colors have been used to really highlight the height of the ground. That's quite hard to see if we go back to this sort of image, these sorts of images here. Um, in this picture, the white parts are the highest ground. And then we go through the rainbow for through red, orange, yellow, green. And the lowest parts are the blues and the purples. Now it's incredible what we can find out just by having a look at craters. First of all, have a look at this crater here. Um, you can see there's craters inside the crater. So this one must have happened first and then this one must have happened after. So you can start to piece together a little um, picture of the history of, of the moon. Um, this one, I spotted, this is quite an interesting one. It's rather than being completely circular or almost circular, um, this one's longer. So that suggests when the asteroid came in, it was more of at an angle, okay? These can tell us all sorts of things. Um, there's a place here in this bluey purple region um, that, has fewer craters. Now that suggests that that's a much younger surface. The more, um, the older a surface is, the more time it's had to uh, gather impact craters. So this suggests that at some point um, in Mercury's past, there was some geological activity going on that made this, it's moved over the original craters that were there. And then after that um, point, these other craters have come on top of it. Um, Anthony says it's flood basalt plain. Thanks, Anthony. It's nice to have a geologist on board. Um, here's a lovely one. Um, this is one of the final photos that the Messenger spacecraft um, sent back. Look at this crater. Um, and the rays that go out of it, um, it, look how far they go. It's absolutely incredible. They're right off the paper here. Um, some of you might be tempted to have a go with some um, flour and dropping something in it. If you do this, please, 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 I suggest outside or in a very large kitchen. NASA suggests at least five feet square of um, protective paper, okay, for a, a small object dropped in flour. But you'll start to see these rays come out because when objects collide, there'll be a lot of heat produced. When anything collides with anything else or rubs against anything else, heat is produced. You can all try it now if you want. If you want to rub your hands together, you can feel that friction um, warming your hands up. Um, this is why we get shooting stars coming through. There's the tiny pieces of rock that burn up as they rub past the air particles in our atmosphere. Um, you can imagine that you get these enormous um it's an enormous amount of heat produced when you have a rock smash in um to the to the planet there and that will um vaporize or, or um liquefy the rock around and it will go and spread out all along now if a rock was big enough to hit Earth, um, what you'd end up with is a huge mushroom cloud, a bit like a nuclear explosion. Um, and that's that's due to the atmosphere. There's very little atmosphere here on Mercury. So you get these 
ray things that um, come out. Ian's got a good question. He says, um, I wonder why some rays are crooked. Looks as if something was flowing. Yeah, the reason you have these rays um, partly is because parts of the crater rim actually stop some of the material getting out. Um, flowing, you'd certainly get uh, molten rock in this. So yes, quite possibly. And you can see that this is green and you're going to blue a land down here. So is, there's a potential of things flowing downhill as well. I'm just guessing there. Donald says cement powder with a thin layer of flour make fantastic creator models. Do be careful if you do that, but that sounds cool. Anthony is putting um, some great information up. Thanks. You may have events where the crater wall is breached and some lava flo flowed out. That's really cool. Thank you. Anthony has got a geology background. Um, so his information is going to be way better than mine on this. So I do keep an eye on the chat and I'll try and keep an eye out too. Um, ooh. So that's Mercury. Okay. Um, I'm going to stick with some of these ideas, though, um, because it's now time to go for fire, ice and aliens. Um, has Mercury got any atmosphere at all? I believe it does have a very, very thin atmosphere. Perhaps one of the astronomers can just put something in chat to, to have that. Oh, lovely. Rowan said Ganymede. Io, Callisto, and Europa. Thanks for introducing those, um, Rowan. Um, I'm just moving on now. I'm just going to carry on and talk about what I was fortunate enough to um, be able to study when I went to uni. Um, it was a project I chose myself. There were many suggestions. I suggested that I think up my own. I thought up, I think, five different projects. I chose three of them to put to um, my tutor and said, can I do any of these? And they were so brilliant. They just said, yeah, you can do any of them. <laughs> um, you choose, they, they, they all look good. Um, so this is what I chose. Now, just a bit of context here. I went to university at a time when email was just about becoming a thing. So one of the things we had to do with email um, was... Um, email our assignments, our computing assignments in. <laughs> we actually had to email them over from the computer room. We then had to walk down the corridor, not very, very politely, on the um, computing lecturer's door and say, has my email arrived? <laughs> so um, it was also a time when the Galileo spacecraft um, was out there um, looking at Jupiter. This is the first thing really to go out since Voyager. Um, it was so, so, so exciting. Um, and um, NASA were releasing their data. They were number crunching it. I was number crunching it. Um, and I remember being so excited. Um, my project supervisor suggested that I email some of the NASA scientists and I did, I sent them an email. Um, they never got back to me, but I didn't care because I sent somebody from NASA an email. Um, <laughs> little things, huh, little things. This is just a um, introduction into some of these. Um, Rowan, I'm glad you said Callisto is your favorite. Um, it's nice to hear that because sometimes Callisto is the forgotten one. Um, Sometimes people, sometimes I've even heard it referred to as the ugly duck moon. Um, basically because people thought it was kind of dark and boring, but 
I say that's because they're not looking hard enough and they certainly don't have any geology background. Um, this is an incredible place. It's the darkest um, object in the, well, moon in our solar system. It's got very unusual dark surface and it's punctuated here. You can see these white bits. So you can see that stuff smashing into the moon and it's pumping out um, some white stuff from underneath. Um, Rowan's also saying it's the most battered surface in the solar system. It's certainly a very, very old surface. And we know that the older surfaces have the most craters. Um, so, um, this, by the way, is this came from a lovely 3D um, thing that I could, I could go around and, and get a few um, stills from. Um, if I go to the other side here, we come to this thing. This is fantastic. It's called Valhalla. And you can, this is the largest kind of um, structure of this ringed type in the solar system. And this is where something has bashed into the moon. And it's probably when it was a kind of solid stroke liquid mushy stuff and you can see those rings have been formed around there and again look how huge that impact was um absolutely enormous so these things they um you just have to look at them to find stuff just have to look at look at it. Uh, when I was studying this, by the way, people were with Galileo mission found loads of extra moons of Jupiter. Jupiter has got fifty three named moons. It's got a further twenty six that are still waiting for names. Um, absolutely incredible. Um, Anthony's put in, this is great, yeah, white areas of pristine ice from the subsurface. This will become really important as we carry on. Amalthea is one of those moons, yeah, it's, an, it's, it's another moon of Jupiter. Um, Donald's put something really interesting. He says it looks like a gla glancing impact from an earlier moon. Um, yeah, it could could well be. I'm just going to move on now to um, Ganymede. Now Ganymede is the next moon in from Jupiter, from, from Callisto. So we're getting closer to Jupiter here. And the next three moons, I'll just show you, I'll just go up and show you. Um, Ganymede, Europa and Io are all tidally locked. Now, this is where it fits in really well with our Sun-Mercury model because a similar thing is happening. Um, the gravity of Jupiter is obviously enormous, but the gravity of these is, is pretty strong too, and they've locked themselves in what's called a tidal resonance. So for every orbit that Io makes, Europa makes two, and Ganymede makes four. And this is doing really interesting stuff to the insides of these moons. The really exciting stuff is what's happening in their centers. And you can see, look at this. This is a um, dark, um, perhaps older surface. And then you've got these lighter, younger surfaces coming over the top. This has been a geological, geologically active moon. Um, it's it's incredible. So this, just by looking at that surface, we know that something might be happening underneath. And once again, we've got this bright, icy stuff coming out when things smash in into the moon. Oh, um, yeah, we'll go on to this. Next one in from Ganymede. 
um, is Europa. Um, Brian says Ganymede has its own magnetic field. Yeah. Um, some of the surface has been resurfaced. Yes, it certainly has. You can see you can see that just by having a look at the the different um, sections. Um, here, that this is where things get really interesting. Okay. Um, you're right, Rowan. I'll get on to that. <laughs> um, this is Europa. Um, I've put this again for the colour contrast. This one over on the left is the true colour. So that's what you would see. It's kind of like a giant snooker ball. Um, clearly a very white surface, quite icy. Um, this is an enhanced one, so we can see the features a little better, and that helps us to learn more. Um, these yellow patches, oh, sorry, yellow patches here are actually patches of salt, sodium chloride, table salt. Um, Brian says, I played with snooker balls exactly like that, yeah. <laughs> um, so salt's really interesting because um, we have a lot of that in our ocean. So table salt in space, well, yeah, sure. Um, um, not sure about any tables, though. <laughs> um, what's happened to this salt is it's become irradiated, which um, means that it then shows up as, as yellow. Um, look at all these cracks around the surface, hardly any craters that you can see. Look at Ganymede, quite a few craters, Callisto, loads of craters. Here, hardly anything. Now that's suggesting that the surface is being renewed constantly. Um, here's a closer look at the surface. And you can see these kind of lines they look like cracks. These are actually kind of a little bit like tectonic plates. Um, if you think of a cross between tectonic plates and maybe an ice flow breaking up, big maybe ice sheet breaking up, these this is evidence of these little pieces of the surface that have been moving around. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> um, I said that Ganymede is a moon of um, Mercury. No, 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 Mercury doesn't have any moons. I'm sorry. Um, um, it's definitely a moon of Jupiter. <laughs> um, Ganymede is bigger than Mercury, though. So here's a, that was a moon that's um, bigger than a planet. Um, Anthony says Ganymede will be kept in place by the gravitational influence of Jupiter and the other Galilean moons, absolutely this tidal locking, they're all connected to each other by um, each other's gravitational pulls, plus the massive pull of Jupiter as well. Um, but what I want to show you now is what might be going on underneath that surface. Um, Here's some more evidence of what there might be. Um, this is an image. It's been put together by computer data. This is not a um, photo. But this is actual water vapor coming off um, Europa here into space. That's absolutely incredible. So there certainly is. Um, water on Europa. Um, so the surface is way too cold for water to last very long in its liquid state. But Anthony says, oh yeah, I believe that the Hubble Space Telescope has confirmed that. Yeah, I think that this data came from the Hubble Space Telescope. But this is how it could be. 
So that tidal locking means that they're pulling on each other, pulling on each other. If you've ever been bored enough to play with a ball of blue tack and you're pulling it and you're pushing it and you're pulling it and you're pushing it, it gets warm. Okay, this is what's happening here. Um, this tidal locking is warming up the interior. There's rock here and you've got volcanoes. And these volcanoes are enough to melt the ice. This is just an artist's impression. Um, every now and then, some of the warm water comes up and it pushes its way through cracks in the surface. And this is what's wiping the, away the evidence of um, a lot of the craters that have that would have um, been formed. They, the, Europe has still got hit. It's just that the evidence was wiped away, much like the evidence of Earth being hit is, is wiped away. Now, this is what um, makes Europa such a good place to look for alien life. Now, if you go back in time um, to maybe around, yeah, around the moon landings in the 1960s, if you suggested to a to the science world that actually there may be life at the bottom of our oceans so deep that it would get no light at all from the sun um you are unlikely to be taken seriously now you've got to remember that the oceans fewer people have been to the bottom of our oceans than have walked on the moon OK, it's so hard to get down there. But look at this. This is in the Pacific Ocean. This is right on our ocean floor. This is what we call a black smoker. It's a volcanic vent. And if you look carefully, um, you can see so deep, no light from the sun at all. Life thrives. You've got a little crab there. You've got some little worm things there. Um, that's incredible. Um, there's another hydrothermal vent here, and these are little worms um, that are feeding off the bacteria that live off the sulfur coming out of the vent. Um, life that um, we have only found out about within the last few decades. So that gives us the tantalizing possibility that if life thrives around places like this here on Earth, what would happen in a salty ocean? We know there's salt because you saw the salt um, deposits on the surface. A salty ocean under the surface of Europa kept warm by, um, by the hydrothermal vents. If you're not convinced by the idea of volcanoes under the sea, um, you need to take a look at the next one. This is Io. Io is, um, to me, it's just the pizza moon. <laughs> I can't see it as anything else. Um, this is the true colour. This is how you'd actually see it. And you can see what I mean. You can see the oh, bit of tomato popping through where you haven't quite put enough of this yellow cheese on. You've got some black olives, okay? scattered around um this is the most volcanically active body in our solar system um i'm just reading anthony's stuff here i'm not very good at multitasking people he says there are tube root there are tube worms and they're chock full of bacteria i would bet you a bag of peanuts that we might find life at the bottom of europa's ocean um yeah um brian i agree with you if we're going to find life anywhere um europa's going to be the place but of course we touched on this yesterday it's the ethics there was a plan to send a spacecraft to europa i'll just go back to the surface um, and smash it into that surface 
and um, see if he could break the ice, see if you could get some samples of what was down there. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, and the reason that's not going to be happening is because scientists are worried that however hard you try to sterilize the spacecraft before you send it up that it still has to travel through our atmosphere it can pick up microbes particularly viruses have been um, viruses can survive for long periods of time in space you smash that into Europa you might have a situation where there was life on Europa but you just killed it off with life of our own um rich says do we have the technology to get into orbit of europa right? yeah absolutely as anthony says absolutely um brian saying there's a mission um <laughs> planned for 2023 called juice jupiter's icy moons explorer cool j jime is that right um If we go back now to um, this, um, as Brian says, it is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. It's the closest to Jupiter. This is where the tidal needing, that um, tidal locking is producing the most energy. Um, these circles that you see here, um, pretty much everywhere, are volcanoes. The yellow color is due to sulfur. And if I go to this one, <laughs> um, this is a false color image. You can see features a little better. But well, what I love is this. This is a volcano that was captured um, erupting by the Galileo spacecraft. These eruptions are can be hundreds of miles high. Um, Io has a smaller gravity gravitational pull than um the earth so unlike earth volcanoes um the volcanoes on io go much much higher okay um it's quite amazing i believe that the moon itself effectively turns itself inside out and renews itself by this volcanic process about once every fifteen thousand years and i think um Anthony will agree, 15,000 years is like a blink of an eye in geology terms. Normally, you have to talk about hundreds of thousands. Um, and he's saying, geologist heaven, plume. Um, a plume is about 100 miles high. Um, Rowan's given us loads of deep sea life. Um, I love the fang tooth. I want to see a fang tooth. Um, Brian said these plumes of sulfur interact with Jupiter's magnetic field. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and um, I'm going to just stop it there. There's a little something that I want to do with you since this is fire, ice and aliens. But I'm thinking, um, well, I'm hoping um, Dan and Theo are watching from downstairs. And I'm really hoping that they bring me up a pineapple. If they bring me a pineapple, I will do the next little bit. Um, it's only small, but whilst that's happening, I'm going to give you a set of numbers and I want you to um, just type in the next, thank you, pineapple's arrived. Um, just type in what you think the next number is going to be just from that little sequence it does link in with life and aliens um i just thought it would be nice to do right at the end i'm just going to have a little bit of my drink before i carry on well done richard 21 it is thank you for confirming um brian Okay, so I'll, I'll leave, I'll, I'll drink this, I'll be back.
<laughs> Rowan says, seeing these comments is probably going to be 21. It is indeed 21. Now, if you're wondering, you can have a play around with these numbers loads. Um, to get from one to the other, you just add up um, the previous two. So one plus one is two, two plus one is three, three plus two is five, five plus three is eight, eight plus five is 13. And 13 plus 8 is going to be your 21. Okay. Now, you'll have to stick with me here, but we've been talking about life, mostly microbes and little sea creatures. I want to talk about plants. And I'm just going to get rid of that screen share for a moment so you can see my pineapple properly. Um, There we go. So here's my pineapple. <laughs> um, I saw this at, we have a local fruit and veg market close to where we are, and it's managing still to go ahead um, through COVID, which is, which is great. And I saw this and it made me really smile because a couple of years ago now, I was involved in a lovely project with a fantastic organisation, Symphony of Viva. They're an orchestra. And um, I got slightly obsessed with pineapples. Um, and they asked me to come along and do a mathematical inspiration session for um young people so as primary secondary and college aged young people <laughs> all at the same time of course um and i really got into pineapples okay saying fibonacci se sequence okay this is something that you can do with a pineapple um i'm not going to do it here because i haven't got the coordination to i'll just try and um show you what what you do please get permission from the fruit owner before you start drawing on your fruit okay do not draw on food just because you've seen this <laughs> without permission but you can see that we've had we have spirals here Okay, I was doing pineapples to link these spirals with music, um, but I'm going to use these spirals to um, link with plants and the possibility of alien plants. Now, we could go around this way, we could go around that way. And if you actually draw a line down them, you might need a Sharpie or something, um, and you count, if you draw all the way down them and you count the number of spirals around, doesn't matter which way you go, you will always come up with a Fibonacci number, okay? So one of those numbers, I'll just get that number sequence up again, if I can. Ah. There we go. Now you can you can play around with these numbers for ages and ages. Um, one thing that's really interesting um, for you to do is to um, divide them. So two divided by one is two. Three divided by two is one point five. Five divided by three. You can carry on doing this, and you get closer and closer and closer to a number that we call phi. It's called the golden ratio. And it's 1.618. If you're arty, you can draw spirals with this as well. Um, if any of you are interested in any of that sort of stuff, there's a wonderful mathematician on YouTube called Vihart, V-I-H-A-R-T. You can explore this way more. Um, now, if we think about a circle, and if you have a look at my... Are you seeing just me now? Just say that you're seeing just me because I, I just closed that without. Yeah, cool. If you have a look at the leaves here, you can see that, you know, you can imagine them 
in a 360 degree circle. Well, if you divide your um, 360 degrees by um, phi, um, you end up with 222.5 degrees, but that's kind of a big um, reflex angle. If you take a smaller one, so 360 minus that number, you get to 137.5 degrees. And this is how plants grow. Um, each, when they grow a new leaf, um, it will be a 137.5 degrees from the last one. And you can keep going around and around and around like that, 137.5 degrees. Now, the reason this they do that is not for anything really spooky or, or um, anything like that. It's simply because this allows them to capture most light and not shade the previous leaves too much. It's the optimal angle for leaf growing in terms of light. You can see my sun up there, light from the sun and capturing that. Now, that's not gonna change. If you had an alien planet going uh, around uh, another star and there was some sort of life form on that planet that used energy from that star and they had to capture that energy somehow, um, then the maths is still the same. That 137 and a half degrees would still be there. So whatever they may use to capture um, that starlight um, would have a very similar structure to plants here on Earth. So whilst the idea of animal life, you know, and, and how similar that would be to Earth and there's a huge diversity, plants um, <laughs> plants, um, I'm pretty confident, just looking at the mathematics of it, um, would look very, very similar in structure to earth plants. Um, obviously, there's a massive diverse uh, diversity. I mean, a pineapple is very different from a blade of grass or a daisy or anything like that. So if you keep those um, differences in mind, but look at the fundamental maths behind it. Yeah, I think alien plants, they wouldn't be too far from a pineapple. Anthony says mathematics is use universal as it as is physics. Maths, to me, it's the language that we use to explain the world around us. Um, Physics, I studied physics because it gets so deep into why um, the world is as it is. And it really does show you that the um, as I said, right in the very first one, the ordinary is also extraordinary. I mean, you think you're sitting down watching this Trust me, you're not. It's not possible to sit. We can only really do something like levitate. Um, if you look into the physics, you'll know that that's true. If um, you've been, if you have an idea of an atom um, with a nu nucleus and electrons whizzing around the outside, just have a think about that for a while, and you'll realise how it's absolutely impossible to to sit. I mean, that's just a fantasy. Um, levitation, that's real. <laughs> um, Anthony says, one plus one makes two anywhere in the universe. Yeah. Um, Star Bear says, our pineapple checks out and we got it from the planet Asda. Mm. Mm -mm. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the questions. If there's anything I um, have. Um, oh. I'm just having a nosy. I noticed, Donald, you've been answering loads of these. I think it would just be nice for our YouTube and Facebook viewers um, to um, 
I have some of those. I'm going to invite you up, um, Donald, in a moment. Just going to um, answer. Thanks, Rich. You're, you're spot on um, here. Why is um, IO yellow? Yeah, Rich says, I think it's due to all the sulfur from the volcanoes. Absolutely spot on, Rich. Thank you for that. Um, by the way, what I'm trying to do here is I have a little button where I can start answering something. And then when I finished answering it, I can press stop answering and it timestamps the video. So if you want the answer to that particular question, you can go to this timestamp. Um, OK, let's get a couple of you up and we'll do. I might be able to have some water. <laughs> I really appreciate what you talking. If I invite you, by the way, and you don't want to come up, just cancel it. I won't ask again. Um, Brian, um, I'm going to invite you up to Anthony. Don't be offended. Um, you're doing fab. Um, where you are, I'll try and keep you involved as well. Um, <laughs> he says, I've earned water. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm probably going to pass out if I don't have water soon. Okay. So hi, Donald. Hi there. Sorry about the COVID hairstyle. COVID hair, oh, we've all got COVID hairstyles. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm getting, I'm getting split ends now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask this top question. Um, maybe Donald, you've already said a little bit about this. Um, what's the best camera to take single photos of space? Well, you could basically use any camera to take photographs of space, but it depends what you want to look at. Um, if you just uh, want to uh, photograph the planets um, or the constellations um, or the Milky Way in the, in the darker areas, um, just a, any kind of camera will, will, will take uh, uh, excellent photographs. Um, a lot of us in the club use... Um, uh, iPhones and uh, Android uh, smartphones to take photographs and we've got some great ones on the website if you want to have a look just using that simple tech. Uh, to take um, longer exposures you really need a DSLR camera and that enables you to take long views of a particular area of the sky. By doing that, what you're doing is you're basically collecting more of the photons that are coming from these tiny little bright uh, spots in the sky, and you start to see things that you can't normally see through a camera, uh, sorry, through your eyes or through a, a simple telescope or binoculars. Um, you can then process those images and get much more advanced coloured uh, images uh, you're able to see uh, the dust, you're able to see um, the hydrogen and the oxygen clouds, etc. You then go on to the much more expensive hobby, which is um, of us real astrophotography, where you're using very advanced cameras um, and CCD cameras, um, where you're able to get very, very high resolution images and take very, very, very long exposures together. Again, these, these photons of light are so rare and so difficult to capture, you need to take very long exposure images. You then get into the complication of, um, because we're moving and the, the uh, celestial uh, globe is moving along with us, if you take very long exposures, you start to see trails of the stars across the sky. So you then have to start tracking them using a, a specialist equipment to be able to do that and keep them stable. So that's really it. Um, by all means, go out and use your smart cam. Uh, take uh, uh, one, or one second or two second images if you can, and you'll see some pretty amazing things. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Can I just add a little thing into that? Um, looking at something, if you want to take a picture of the moon, you could take a picture of the moon using, uh, say, a DSLR, and you, you, 
because the moon is so bright you would have a very short exposure time anyway so you would probably use something like one six hundred and fiftieth of a second or something like that you know very bright if you or the other option is to use something like a webcam so you can get a simple webcam and attach it to your telescope and then you can use that because it takes a video and then what you do is you put all those video pictures together to make one image of, of whatever you're looking at Again, if you go on to the DDAS website, you'll see a lot of the images taken by um, all age groups within the uh, within the society. Yes. Some really good ones. And our our meeting next week is actually about observing uh, the nebula, so looking at nebula and things like that, and then perhaps learning how to, to photograph them as well. So that might be worth people logging on to see. Um, you know what's going off there yeah that sounds brilliant i just invited chris up um he's connecting at the moment in he said that he'll show some examples in tomorrow's presentation that's that's brilliant thank you chris i'm not sure if you if the system's going to <laughs> kick in um at all um i think we're going to just ask one more question this session and i'll let people have their evenings um I like this one. Um, I forgot to mention it. So, um, oh, uh, Chris says, got invite but can't join. We'll sort it out sometime. Um, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> um, it'll be fine. Um, I like this one. Why did for some creators have little points in the middle? I loved your answer, Donald. If you can just um, go through that a little bit. If you take a simple glass of milk and drop something like a marble into it, what you'll see is a disturbance on the surface, a circular disturbance, um, which looks like a crater. But you'll also see towards the end of the impact a projection of milk coming up from the center where the, where the marble had gone, that went into to the milk. That's exactly the same as you would see on an impact crater with a small hump in the middle. Uh, the majority of impact craters have um, that little hump in the middle initially, but it's weathered away on a lot of them, or the crater has been infilled with dust, as you, as you can see when you observe the moon. So it's it's um, when anything impacts at that incredibly high velocity onto the surface of a planet or a moon, it liquefies the surface effectively. So the surface becomes like a liquid and, re and looks like a glass of milk for a few milliseconds. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? The other thing I said earlier was a great way to to test this or try it at home is take a, a map of, of the moon and there's plenty of them on, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the web and have a look at the shape of different craters, where the little humps are, whether they're tear shaped or whether they're circular, whether they're higher on one edge or the, or the other edge. And then take a, a simple tray, and what we use is cat, a cat's litter tray, something like that. Put some cement dust into it, and then sprinkle some um, white flour onto the surface. And take marbles and throw them into the surface at different angles. And what you see is them forming perfect little craters. And from that, Use that information, go back to the moon map and see if you can find a crater of the same shape and the shape, same similar size and see if you can figure out what angle that, that, uh, that object hit the moon at. It's, we, we do it with schools a lot and they absolutely love it. It's a bit messy. <coughs> beware, of, 
Beware, uh, the best thing to do is, is wear eye protection and hand protection because um, cement dust can be quite uh, corrosive. So be careful with it. The other way to do it is using cocoa powder and flour. But cocoa powder is much more expensive than cement. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. That's just brilliant. Um, yeah, and, and do wear protection if you try that. And and I would suggest yeah. outside would be a good place. <laughs> outside, outside is perfect. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing my front room. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Anthony's um, just put about the um, points in the middle. Um, um, shockwave rebounds causes the central peak. Crater Copernicus on the moon has a central peak. It's also a ray crater as well. How, just how easy is that to? Um, oh. <laughs> um, how easy is that to see through a telescope? Could you actually see? Crater Copernicus on the moon. Oh yeah, definitely through a telescope. Definitely through a telescope. Yeah, it's, uh, it's up, it's up near, up at the top of um, uh, Oceanus Procellarum. Very up cool. Area. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I think most of the other questions that we haven't answered yet relate to telescopes um, and we're going to leave those for tomorrow um ask them again tomorrow that's really cool there's only okay. one that can possibly answer today and i i'll only give a fuzzy sort of answer to this um which is why are planets and moons always named after gods and go goddesses apart from Uranus's moon which is named after shakespeare characters well it's historical um the stars were so important for us um if you think of just the stars um and you're trying to maybe grow some food or you're looking at the seasons um because of earth the earth's journey around the sun um certain stars would be just coming up above the horizon at a time when flooding happens or at a time when um the temperature started getting warmer, so every springtime the stars would be in a certain place. Now, it's no great leap to have a look from at the stars and think, oh, okay, the stars are over in this part of the sky right now. That's telling us that it's going to get a, a, a bit warmer. Um, Anthony's just put, the sky was thought to be the residence of the gods. Yeah, the gods up, up there. Um, also, stories of the glue that hold us as humans together. I mean, stories and pictures as we saw um, with the moon rabbits that the brains are set up to detect pictures even when there aren't any, any there, and, and songs as well. And this would just be a part of culture. People would have been using the stars to explore other parts of their lives, things that were happening. and. Um, entertainment as well it, it's all it's all um, connected in there um, we're going to leave it there and um, thank you very much everyone for coming along come back tomorrow tomorrow we'll say more about Jupiter which is of course the biggest planet in the solar system and also Derby and District Astronomical Society you're going to be back I hope um, to um, talk about telescopes and binoculars. That's something that I really can't talk very much about at all. Um, Rowan, um, maybe we will talk about Neptune at some point on Sunday. I'm, I'm aware that we kind of left um, Uranus and Neptune out. I might talk about them a little um, at some point. Yes, but for now, please share we need a few more people in. Um, it's quite hard, especially during the week. Um, so do share, um, get people interested. Um, I think some people are trying to play catch up with things as well. So we're still getting more and more people signed up for our very first event and they've been watching that. I, I can tell that. Um, hopefully they'll catch up and get us a few more viewers as well. But yeah, do us a favor and, and, and sort that one out to encourage people and don't forget um, we're going all the way through to the 31st of January to get us through to the end of this gloomy wet 
cold months. Um, thank you, everybody, and bye.